Hi there. Um, so there's, there's a lot of sort of intertwined concepts here. And uh, I tried to sort of condense it as much as possible. But all of these things, it's sort of easy to balloon. So uh, you may see me sort of skipping over a lot of slides and then skipping back depending on uh, where the conversation goes. So uh, if then, feel free to ask any questions whenever uh, is usually how I like to do it, if anything sort of uh, piques your interest in the first place. So uh, I called this Small is Beautiful. If anybody's familiar with the work by E.F. Schumacher, uh, it was written in the 70s. And it was sort of uh, like a Bible for the, the, then the Back to the Land movement. And the idea was move back to the land, uh, scale everything smaller to make it more manageable about direct democracy, smaller towns. When, uh, when applied to larger cities, it was more about neighborhood level decision making. Uh, it was still those ethos you see retaining a major impact in society. However, at the same time, now we start to see the talk about big data. And you start to see uh, real, real impacts of using massive, massive algorithms, finding large patterns. Uh, by compiling data sets from, on the, from up the county level up to the top. And of course, uh, you know, we see the, uh, the results of that in elections and, uh, and continued through uh, the Obama administration even today. Now, one of the organizations, uh, and the organization that I am a part of, is called Code for America. Anybody who's not familiar with Code for America, uh, it's it's sort of a loosely, uh, or at least our program is sort of a loose knit fellowship uh, of like minded technologists, uh, community organizers, basically civic minded hackers is how it goes. And uh, Code for America, we have four different programs, uh, of which the fellowship was the first, uh, and that basically takes sort of rock star software developers. Uh, it was originally based, and it still is based in San Francisco. Uh, and they pair them up with a select few cities. I can't remember if Portland, Oregon was ever one of them. But I know Boston was one of the first. Uh, and they select, usually select like four cities. And they pair these great developers, and they end up coming up with civic apps. So if anybody's ever heard of like Adopt a Hydrant, uh, or they do a lot of work with Open 311, and they really do a lot of good helping government websites or any ways that municipal governments in particular can use technology to better serve their citizens. The brigade is what we're part of. The brigade was originally conceived to sort of follow up the fellowship. When the fellows uh, finished their year-long tenure in these municipal governments, the brigade, the idea was to have a lasting footprint of all volunteers, but they have a program of uh, captains, brigade captains for each brigade to ensure that this structure doesn't sort of just last for a couple of meetups and then dissipate. So I actually share the brigade in the state of Maine. Uh, so I come from the other Portland, as a matter of fact. Uh, although, and this is one of the distinguishing factors, and one of the things I'm really going to focus on is how code for Maine differs to some degree from the pattern usually established or usually followed uh, by most other Code for America brigades. And I think the findings that, we, that we've discovered may be of significance to people in other smaller cities, uh, even developing nations, I think we'll see. And the part that open hardware plays, that, that was maybe one of the more surprising elements, is how open hardware has really actually emerged as such an important theme for smaller cities, areas which normally would not fit in for whatever reason, sort of fall out of the confines of these uh, of the benefits that you would get out of normal uses of big data. Uh, so these other two, we have the accelerator. The accelerator uh, is it's, it, there's only one of them. It's based in San Francisco, and the idea is it's it's basically a civic startup accelerator. And the concept of civic startup is something that uh, I hope to get to later on because that may be a very very important structure for, uh, for hardware especially, open civic hardware especially. Uh, and the peer network is, uh, it's a, this is their newest program. This is for 
any size municipality to sort of join and just sort of share ideas, whether or not, whether they're part of the fellowship or whether there's a brigade in the town or not. These are just some of the apps. This is what normally a Code for America brigade would be working with. And these are just the apps that were developed out of the fellowship uh, just this year, just in 2012. Super Mayor, Super Mayor Emanuel, if there's anybody here from Chicago, the Chicago Brigade is, is, is the super brigade. These, these guys, we've, we follow everything they do. They're fantastic. And uh, ever since Mayor Emanuel took power, they've had uh, a lot of collaboration with city government, with the, uh, with the municipal offices. So they created this app, Super Mayor Emanuel. And it's sort of like a Super Mario Brothers version of Rahm Emanuel. And every, <laughs> every time, uh, I think, Every time a new commit or a better commit is, uh, uh, is committed to GitHub, to their GitHub repo, uh, Super Mayor Emanuel jumps and gets another couple points. <laughs> he keeps moving through uh, the Super Mayor Emanuel world. That's one of my favorite ones. But all of these, like Open Counter, this is meant for the city of Santa Cruz to make it easier, navigate their business permitting processes, uh, and just sort of using uh, user interface uh, principles you might be familiar with or anybody would be familiar with in the startup world, but in government, that's certainly the last thing that they've ever really thought of. So it really, really helps a lot of these things. And then all of these, of course, are open source. So you can grab these right off of GitHub. You can modify the, co modify the code, and then you can apply them in your own town, and you can maintain them, most importantly, with a brigade. So the brigade program has been going on for about a year, and already it's taken on certain characteristics, more than maybe they were even planning on. And you start to see brigades taking on certain characteristics of their cities, right? Uh, and that's really what I want to focus on, why Code for Maine, again, focuses on open hardware. This is, so these are the two sort of flagship apps that we've come out of. And again, it's open hardware. So on national, I don't know, did anybody participate in the National Day of Civic Hacking? It just happened a couple, couple days ago. Uh, it was a fantastic, fantastic couple days. I mean, a lot of people put a lot of work into it. And we had probably over the course of both days, 50 people come in. This, the event on the left is in Portland. The event on the right is in Bangor. That's, again, why we're Code for Maine. We focus on the whole state uh, than just the city of Portland. Uh, and so you see quite a few people just on the first day in the city of Bangor. And a city that size, Bangor, if anybody's ever been there, it's not a very big city. When you get 50 participants to something like a Civic Hack Day, that's a pretty significant uh, event for that day. And it also explains why all three news networks showed up that day. And uh, it still is the talk of the town. For uh, You still see people talking about it now. Uh, so the, it, it, it ended up becoming this really, really amazing uh, and picking up this amazing intensity way beyond what we expected. Nevertheless, there wasn't a heck of a lot of coding going on. There wasn't a lot of what the normal pattern, what, what we originally had hoped to see, to fork a repo, use this, the, the usual open source software process. Uh, didn't see a lot of code getting written. What we did see come out of it are two hardware deployment. Now, how we incorporate this into the civic world when there really isn't, uh, it's sort of breaking the mold in that way. Uh, that's what I find really, really interesting. And so that's sort of what we're focusing on now is how can we actually introduce this concept of open hardware? What are the issues that start to, uh, that start to arise? What are the differences? Uh, what are the capacity issues, for example? Is, is it going to be as simple? Uh, we'll explore some of these later, but what that is on the right, it's one iteration of an open vehicle tracker, uh, something that I personally have been working on even before Code for Maine uh, for public transit uh, applications, something uh, I took a lot from this Portland. It's quite advanced in terms of open source transit apps, but in rural states like Maine, there's a lot of ground to cover. And so before you can even get to the point of sharing open data sets, you have to actually track the vehicles. That costs money. So that's where these that kind of things can come in. 
But we discovered, or at least these guys discovered in Bangor, that that's not the only application that they could be used for. And in fact, the city specifically requested, they said, our biggest problem is tracking snow plows. We get a lot of snowstorms up there, right? Uh, and they have munis and any city is going to have a municipal fleet, and they're, they don't have very much money for an enterprise level vehicle fleet management system. So being able to track the snow plows, collect that data, even just a data logger would be a huge, huge, huge asset for them. But that's not the only application. Uh, out of Portland, what they came out of was called the Butler. <laughs> uh, and the idea of that is it's just a little pipe that you can stick cigarette butts into. And it, the uh, brigade, I think they're collecting a, a group of volunteers. And they are using the Adopt a Hydrant platform for that. Uh, and that's why you see this website here, Adopt a Butler. And the idea is you can adopt each butler to volunteer to maintain it. Then there's a service that actually recycles the used cigarette butts. Uh, I forget what they make out of them. I think it's like uh, bicycle seats or something like that. Uh, but you need to collect a lot of them. So at every bar, all the local bars where there's lots of, you know, everybody goes outside to smoke, you stick one of these uh, butlers out there. Uh, and so it's a great idea, it's a great example. Both of these are examples of how you can use open source software. And in fact, it's because of the availability of the open source software that the open source hardware deployments can happen. But you still need to get that last, as we, as we say in transportation, the last mile. Right? You still need to have that actual uh, level of interaction. So <laughs> this, uh, this I put on here, this is a picture of the Bangor group. And uh, this is something that actually happened. So <laughs> we found ourselves talking. There, a clown walked in after being told. Uh, he came all the way in from Presque Isle, Maine. It was a long, long, long way to Bangor. I think it's almost like three hours. And he, had, he was recommended to come to the Civic Hack Day out of the job employer. The job coach said, um, you're a clown. You work in creative industries. Uh, I don't know. How about this Civic Hack Day? That sounds interesting. <laughs> Why they recommended that, I don't know. But what I do know is he ended up showing up. The folklorist is me, by the way. I have no background in technology whatsoever. Uh, however, what I do have a background in is in seeing the connections and the, the importance of culture and how place and culture can, can play such a strong role in production, specifically, and actual physical production. And then a game designer walks in. <laughs> Once this interaction happens, the clown, the game designer, end up working on certain user interfaces. Products start happening, because the folklorist makes the connection. Right? <laughs> this is the kind of thing that I like to think is happening. In fact, Mainers are almost used to this kind of thing. This is, it's, it almost felt, and people commented on this, it felt sort of appropriate, but something that has been missing from civic life in places like Maine, or I know for a fact I used to live out uh, outside of Eugene in Portland. It's very, I mean, uh, in Oregon. It's very similar out here, too. So I think the, there are certain shared characteristics in lower density, not necessarily suburban, but rural areas where there are certain traditional civic institutions that still carry on. This is something that's it's sort of second nature to a traditional civic institution in rural areas. But it has been missing in a lot of places, at least especially in Maine for the last 20 years. And this is the result. So what you have in Maine, uh, and the more research we did, the numbers start to really back up these, uh, this hypothesis. Right? When it comes to the numbers and the technology industry and tech literacy in general, Maine is pretty abysmal. <laughs> And it may be the same, again, uh, it's just because Maine is a very low density state. We have a lot of rural areas. When you actually chop things down into non-urban areas, you might start to see similar numbers as well. But the tech literacy is absolutely abysmal. So when you're part of an organization who's using technology to encourage civic engagement, and you have to actually encourage the technology to get to the engagement, that may seem like too much of a job, except for the fact that it's one of the leading states in civic engagement. So in a way, it's actually the total opposite. Right? You have people who are very, very familiar, very accustomed with, um, we, we still have a town meeting system in the vast, vast majority of the municipalities there, which is really a true participatory democracy. There's no 
voting for a representative to make a decision, any citizen of that town can show up, request an item be on the town warrant, would be familiar with Robert's Rules of Order, you can call a vote, people vote on it right there and then. Uh, that's still done in the vast majority of Maine towns. And because of that, you still see, even amongst youngers, even amongst uh, the transplants, we've, we found in Portland, for example, Bangor, it was almost all developers. In Portland, the developer to self-described community organizers, quote unquote, ratio, was like 12 organizers for every one developer. <laughs> and I think the re there's a reason for that. I think people move there, I know I did, people move there saying, this is a small enough city where I can have an impact. And this is, by the way, this is before, uh, the thought of using technology for civic engagement was ever a thought. So I'm thinking when I lived in New York myself and I see a pothole, I'm thinking, I really cannot do anything about this pothole. <laughs> the, way, the distance between me and the kind and, and the action that it would take to fill in this pothole is so great that there's no way I'm going to get there. But if I move to Maine, I know I can actually get to the point where this pothole can get filled in whether it's running for, for state government, whether it's knowing is because your neighbor's this, or the governor or something like that. Uh, by the way, my neighbor is the ex-governor, uh, <laughs> just by chance. Uh, so these are some pictures. This is actually my hometown right here. Uh, and this is a, uh, an ethnography that was sort of done about uh, town meeting day and the importance of town meeting day in Maine and New England towns. And this was an interesting from, this is my folklorist side talking because this was actually done as an expression of, this is what Maine's folklore is, right? So you may have the South, in the South, you may have the Delta blues or you may have bluegrass or, uh, or various forms of vernacular music. To him, the, uh, and this, I forget the writer's name, but he was uh, Stephen King's teacher, <laughs> believe it or not. Uh, for him, town meeting, this is New England's contribution to American folk vernacular. And the example he used, all of this stuff, town meeting day, and it still is, is an all day affair. But it's not just voting and sitting there and, and doing boring things. You have, it breaks up for dances, you have community suppers, it's really, there's a certain festival atmosphere to it. Not all towns are going to have that. But to tell the truth, a lot of those pictures, the places that a lot of those pictures were, you s still the exact same thing. The, uh, the bean supper menu hasn't changed very much, and maybe it could use a little bit of spicing up. Uh, but besides that, it's more or less uh, the same. It is true, however, that you don't see too many young faces in there. Uh, and it's, it is very tough. So you have one of the, one of the stronger associations in Maine is the Maine Municipal Association, and they're in charge of trying to promote town meeting literacy. They have a major, major problem reaching younger people. That's where we actually saw our connection. So this is actually, this is a sort of classic Code for America move. The, uh, the Code for DC, the DC chapter of the Code for America Brigade, they developed an app, it was very simple, but there's a similar local assembly structure based in DC, just because of the unique structure of Washington, D.C., and the municipal government. It's called the uh, Advisory Neighborhood Commission. It has limited sort of uh, authority, but either way, most residents don't know about it. They made this very simple app. You can just type in your location, and it'll give you all the information about where your neighborhood advisory commission meets. Uh, and then from there, it can build up. You can actually use it as a repository for the minutes, for the, temp for the warrant, blah, blah, blah. So our idea, of course, is to fork this repo and then just very simply change it to town meeting day, right? This is your town, zip code, here's your meeting, there you go. Immediately though, we found our problem, uh, and oops, I'll get there in a sec. The problem was most of the town warrants uh, are in hard copy, right? It's not even in PDF form, <laughs> uh, even today. So I think this is frozen. I think my thing is frozen. I can keep talking until it figures itself out. Okay, there we go. Uh, so that leads into, again, that last mile. Once again, we're faced with hardware, we're faced with interface. I'm gonna skip through a lot of these slides, I think, but the idea of this was to show is that participatory culture 
doesn't just extend to uh, to decision making in politics. It extends to uh, economic, the private sector as well. Uh, and if anybody's ever familiar with Eleanor Ostrom, uh, she unfortunately just died recently, but she was a fantastic sociologist, won the Nobel Prize. She was the first woman to win the Nobel Prize for economics, I think, just a couple years ago. She, the, what, the work she won that for, a major, major uh, case study for it was how the lobster fisheries are managed in Maine. And it's a fantastic, fantastic case. If, if anybody's ever been to Maine, and I live right on the coast, the idea of uh, territory, uh, lobstering is very, very territorial. So the idea of laying pots in somebody else's territory is like, of course you don't do that. It's against, you assume it's against the law. Everybody knows it's gotta be against the law. The truth is there's no real law saying you can't do that, but you won't do it, trust me. <laughs> there, and so she was fascinated by this, is this, there's this certain intersection of, uh, of official institutional legal structures, extra legal, uh, some may call it um, uh, vigilante justice, vigilante style, but she used it as an example of common pool uh, what is it? common pool resource management? And it was an argument against, uh, I don't know the economic theory very well, but it's, it was disproving the theory of the commons that uh, one person will take over a common pool resource and uh, ruins it for everybody. Tragedy of the commons, thank you. Thank you. What was the name of the economist uh, who? Adam? Really? Smith came up with tragedy of the commons? Yeah, it was in the 60s. And the theory was it was sheep grazing in the common about grazing lands and oh. right. Well, it's fascinating stuff. Anyway, but she actually in this work she used this as one example. There were a number of others, and there were a number of characteristics to showing how there could be common pool management of public resources, and the lobster fisheries is one. And she also, one of those is that it's cultural, it's based in cultural traditions is why. And in fact, keeping out outsiders is one of the essential characteristics uh, to common pool management, which would include me, unfortunately. But <laughs> even though I was literally born five miles across the border in New Hampshire, you're an outsider in Maine. Uh, and of course, here we have barn raisings, various quilting bees. These are all sort of traditional forms of what I would call open source development. I think this, is, this applies very, very well. This is my, uh, the Grange Hall. So all of these, the reason I included this is just to show that these institutions still exist. These, they're, they're fading fast, they're aging, they're desperately looking for new blood, and new people to fill them. This hall's still there, it's 100 years old. Um, in the bigger cities, and this is something that I think we would find here in, I think actually uniquely you find in this Portland, uh, is the importance in the 19th century of trades organizations, not unions, they're sort of precursors to unions, but uh, trades organizations. This one, this particular one was the Charitable Mechanics Association. And the more we've done research into this, we realized it was sort of like a maker's space or a maker's collective for the 19th century. And it was great, it was all volunteer labor uh, and all craftsmen and did this fantastic job on this building the reason I included it is this, hopefully, is going to be the first makerspace, the home of the first makerspace. Uh, and it's still known, it's still the Charitable Mechanics Association, still the same institution, but we've been in talks to house the makerspace, 3D printer, and everything there. Uh, and how, how much more appropriate can you get than that? And it's a perfect example of traditional institutions, um, traditional participatory institutions, marrying, wedding, uh, contemporary open source institutions. Uh, and these are the groups. So you have the Maine Charitable Mechanic Association teaming up with Hack Portland, <laughs> you have on the left, which is our local hack group. Uh, this is another example where uh, it was, it's a local, uh, a local freight, an indoor farmer's market. They were able to raise $18,000 uh, uh, on Kickstarter, purely with local money. So this, uh, that's the civic technology part. This is the important part, I want to get into makers. And really, when 
I started to think when I first started getting Make Magazine and understanding the maker movement, I sort of took a look around me and was thinking, okay, wait a minute, so who isn't a maker around here? Uh, is that the right one? There we go. Now, how many people who have been, well, anywhere, are used to seeing the, uh, a truck made out of a junk, made out of junkyard scrap, right? It's almost like a Jeff Foxworthy sketch, <laughs> the engine hanging out of the, the tree. If, if you have a truck made out of, uh, in fact, it's also a Johnny Cash song. If anybody's familiar with one piece at a time, that should be the maker anthem, I think. <laughs> and it didn't cost me a dime. <laughs> but the question here is, and I started thinking about this when I was talking to my brother, who's a mechanic, and he was telling me after uh, a long time talking about uh, you know, ra rolling his eyes at uh, jailbreaking iPhones and all of this, what he considers you know, tech talk, blah, blah, blah. And then he goes about talk, telling me how he's essentially jailbroken his brakes or his accelerator, right? which just uses, um, uh, it, it's, it doesn't, it's not even a mechanical process anymore. Right? It's, uh, it's, uh, I've drawn a blank, but it's, you know, it's, 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 it's a P, uh, what is it? Pulse with my, PWM, yeah. Pulse width modulation. So uh, an accelerator is going to use pulse width modulation when it's accelerating. Right. Uh, and any, any vehicle made after 96, I think, when they started, uh, when they started requiring the emission standard is going to have some sort of a CAN bus. So what these people do is they actually flash their cars and everything, including their accelerators, their brakes. And it's the same exact process as rooting a phone or jailbreaking a phone. It's getting rid of floatware, it's making, you're putting your warranty, of course, uh, but it's, it, it's optimizing it with a custom ROM. And you have these sites, you have these communities that have custom ROMs you can download and you can flash your car with. When I found that out, I'm thinking, okay, there's anything that really has a digital ch chip in it. I bet you there is a maker community for. There is somebody that's going to have a custom ROM and it's going to share certain characteristics. How many of these are aware of other maker communities or even know the word maker or hacker is a different story. Now, I used an example right here. Uh, this is one of my favorite ones. It's from barbecue, uh, competing barbecue smoking. These guys actually sell an Arduino set. And they have, and this was a famous one. Uh, and this has become one of the more popular uses for Arduinos. Uh, and this isn't the PWM, it's the PID setting. So it has very, very accurate temperature control, perfect for uh, something that takes long, tapered off uh, temperature uh, you know, kind of, and very, very exact and controlled. That and espresso, right? Espresso machines use PID as well. Uh, but the question is, how many of these people in smokingmeatforms.com <laughs> do you think are frequenting Arduino.cc or, uh, or Make Magazine? Uh, some of them, for sure, especially since you see Arduino here, that may be a way of onboarding some people. But these people may be, the, the interest is going to be in the subject itself. This is just a new method of getting there, and it revolutionizes the whole industry. So where we come into it is once we started seeing all of this stuff, once we start seeing the open source vehicle tracker and the Butler, both hardware interfaces, and we started to see the larger... Uh, the larger circles of involvement that that's such hardware, or uh, I think the better word for it now I start hearing is physical hacking, uh, that physical hacking can involve. I mean, somebody may be a Node.js genius, a rock star developer, but still not know how an electrical circuit works, and vice versa. And so where physical hacking comes in is it's perfect because it's, it's going to be able to use somebody like my brother who's a mechanic, for example, his knowledge is going to be invaluable if I'm doing something like a vehicle tracker, right? Might not know how to code. Okay, now this is my favorite picture of them all. It might not be immediately obvious. <laughs> when it comes to documentation and distributed production and development, the problem with open hardware, of course, is you don't have the GitHub for open hardware. I'm going to make the argument later that the GitHub for open hardware is GitHub. <laughs> But regardless, it's still not necessarily optimized. It's not going to be as known uh, and as familiar with people. Certainly, even in Code for America, you don't see repos on there for uh, 
the DIY book scanner, for example, which is what this is. I use this as an example because it is a DIY hardware community. It's been very well developed. They've used a wiki, they've used online distributed methods, and they've come up with a pretty, pretty advanced design uh, out of that method. The picture on the right is my favorite part. I've been advocating for this. This is where the uh, town warrant in hard copy comes in. So my idea was to use something like this to have, I, would, I called it a scanathon. Uh, and have residents from different towns bring in their town warrants so you could scan them in. Their uh, Code for America does have some pretty good OCR um, uh, and cataloging software that we could use. And so you combine the two, and now you can actually start to build a real database in our own sort of grassroots form of, I wouldn't call it big data, but you know, once it's digital, then you can start doing, you know, that's when the magic can start up. So before I could actually get to this, in my, in my hometown, in my home library, I meet with the librarian and he tells me, oh, I've already built one of those. Not only has he built one of those, but if you look over here, he built it out of a lobster trap. <laughs> that's what he had for an enclosure. That's what he had for an enclosure. Mind you, that's not an aesthetic choice. That's what he had in the basement. <laughs> it's the most readily available uh, material. I could email that to you, by the way. Uh, it's this, this is my favorite picture of all time because it makes my case for me, right? <laughs> uh, and not only that, but he also had been thinking of a scanathon. However, he's, I, I can't remember if he was even familiar with the term open source. Certainly wasn't familiar with the term hackathon. His idea was to call it a scanning bee. Yeah. <laughs> And now you're starting to talk about vernacular language, referring to the same thing, the whole, uh, the whole hacker terminology problem. You know, you're starting to take on regional characteristics. It would be great to start seeing those things develop and take a concerted effort. Uh, but this, is, this could be the whole thing right here. I mean, this is my favorite of them all. The, but there, the, that is another reason why I used it, is because it is on GitHub. Uh, the, the whole of its development is not on GitHub, but they do have the files. Uh, and I think when it comes down to it, all of these, including both of our apps that came out of Civic Hack Day, they both, they're both possible because of open source software. So we do need a GitHub to be able to make them work. But what we really need to do is find a way of working with GitHub that we can use, we can host the software on that, but it can also fit the open hardware design process. And hardware is probably, that's, that's the, uh, or physical uh, hacking, you know, that, that's just the term that's, that, that's out there right now. There's got to be a better term for it, I think. Um, well, by hardware, are you talking about logic design, the schematics? There are languages that do that part. Right, exactly. So that's got to be part of it. Uh, and, but the question is, I consider myself, for example, I started learning on Arduino and from the hardware part of things. On the other hand, I'm, uh, it was a lot easier for me to learn Python uh, and processing than it is to learn Eagle files. Uh, Fritzing, Fritzing's a good start. But uh, I, I do think, even amongst the hacker community, the, uh, the industrial design, the knowledge of industrial design is just is something that really needs to be uh, short, I think, uh, to be more mainstream. Right? It needs to be included in a lot of this stuff. Uh, and maybe it's because industrial design has been a profession, and it's been for decades. And as a profession, that knowledge is that knowledge. That's you go to school and become an industrial designer. So I think it's it, it is important to bring in those principles, very basic principles of, of really good design. Because really good design, of course, it's not going to be something that nobody can do. Right? It's going to be something that that's accessible. This is another picture of it, by the way. This is the guy who designed it. Um, and you see he's using a, a regular monitor. I brought in my Raspberry Pi that day, so he was quite happy to see that. But he wasn't using one. He was, um, uh, but he was using, uh, I think they used OpenSCAD for their, uh, for their design. Uh, and they have a bill of materials. And they have a pretty good template for it, but it's still not really standardized practice. This is the Adopted Butler. Here's the uh, open vehicle tracker. This is the iteration that they came up with in Bangor. This is an iteration that I came up with right here. Um, 
more, this was, uh, I had in mind public transit applications, but uh, this one actually has both GPRS and GPS capability. GPRS? Uh, um, GSM. Okay. Like, uh, this is a SIM card right here. Sure. Um, but it also has uh, micro SD data logging capabilities. Uh, a lot of great work being done on the back end side of this using it open WRT. Uh, and because that was another missing component up until recently, you had to use like freemium services like Cosm, which is now something else, I think. Uh, but when I was building it, I didn't realize that there were so many other applications, by the way. Uh, not only plow trucks or uh, standard utility fleet management, but school buses, right? Every town's gonna have a school bus. Uh, and that's actually something that Code for America does have. They have a Where's My Bus app that they created for Boston. So it allows for secure logging in for parents and things like that. So you don't have just anybody coming in. Um, although I wanted to use it and embed it in my, the CAN bus of my wife's car so she wouldn't get stuck behind the school bus every morning and be late for work. <laughs> um, I'm going to skip through these, but this is just showing why we started this work on uh, on the last mile issue and why this was the, the motivation was because these small transit agencies just really, they couldn't even get to the point of hiring somebody even to convert their PDF timetables into Google Maps, GTFS, let alone uh, a multi-thousand dollar, um, what do they call it, automatic vehicle location, AVL system. So we've been developing this, but we've also been looking into maybe taking the next step because there, there are other barriers. There are other uh, barriers to using GSM or cellular networks, especially if you're up in a place like Presque Isle where nobody can get frequent reception. Uh, but you have a small compact town and most importantly, a fixed route. Now you can actually start talking about mesh network. They've been trying to do this stuff for years with automotive tech, but of course you have to get everybody to adopt it in their private vehicles. In a public transit network where you have a fixed route and even better, maybe only three or four buses, you can map out exactly where the radius of that mesh is going to be. Uh, and a lot of great work is being done in that. Um, the Open Technology Institute, or the uh, New American Foundation, they've been do developing a mesh network called Commotion Wireless, based in OpenWRT. And basically, you can you use it, you embed, I think it's just a, an app that runs a little tiny version of OpenWRT as an app, and it, would, it runs in any device, cell phone, smartphone, laptop, anything. And then it tr basically turns that into a repeater uh, while walling it off from any potential malware. I'm sure it's not from all malware. I'm sure somebody will figure something out, but early adopters, right? you got to take the risk. <laughs> On this level, uh, well, nobody's really done it on this level. I mean, no, nobody's ever usually, and this is actually the real issue, and I should probably uh, skip to this, actually. Uh, here we are. This is the problem. And this is going to be our major barrier, right? We could do all of this right now. There's nothing stopping us. The, as we speak right now, they could put in an order for a couple of Arduino shields. They already wrote the, uh, the code. And you could have every bus and every snowplow. Snow, luckily, it's not snowing up there anymore. But uh, every municipal vehicle in Bangor could have vehicle tracking. What's preventing it? They can't legally just do that. They have to go through the official uh, bureaucratic process, the request for proposals. They call it the RFP, or uh, there, there are other versions, even more bureaucratic version, the uh, request for ideas, or request for submissions, I think. There's a whole, they're all just acronyms that mean nothing. But the result is the same, whether it's a small town or a big city. You get large engineering firms. Some of them are good, some of them are bad. But the ones who end up getting the RFP usually are professional RFP applicants not necessarily professional vendor, right? Once that RFP is, uh, is awarded, once that contract is awarded, we find, especially in rural areas where you don't get a lot of response anyways, there's not much motivation to continue that development. Uh, it's a lot like proprietary software, for example. 
right? So you have a five year, sometimes you have a five year uh, review cycle. At the end of that review cycle, it's okay, do we want to keep going or do we want to stop? And by then you're already locked in. Uh, one, at least one area in the, in the realm of IT, in the realm of software, where that kind of thing can be really innovative. There is work being done um, in Philadelphia. Yeah, there it is. In Philadelphia, uh, Mark Head, who used to be on the board, or maybe even still be on the board of uh, Code for America, is now the chief innovation officer of the city of Philadelphia, is experimenting with using GitHub for procurement. Uh, and it's the same open source principles. It's iterative design. You, know, it's, you have open, uh, uh, open contributions, and it's the same exact principle, distributed development. So they're trying to work with, with using that, and it's just one pilot project. But this one might be the most promising development right now. The Presidential Innovation Fellows is our sister project, the Code for America sister project, that's actually working in an official capacity with the Obama administration. Uh, and in fact, I think Jennifer Palka, the founder of Code for America, is now working for Todd Park, the chief innovation officer, on making this much more uh, a, a sister, an actual sister organization. They came up with this, and this is actually a fantastic, they've done some fantastic work on this. It's really to reform not only the RFP process, but to set a standard for how it can be done, how it can be simplified. Uh, it's at least for small businesses to be able to compete on the same playing field as a professional RFP applicant. Uh, but for a smaller town, uh, it's only a smaller step if this is successful to make it uh, open to individuals as well. So this is promising, and I think in Maine, if we get government on our side, and there's no reason why they're not on our side, they, they're free, we're, we're helping their job for free, so they love us. Uh, but still, the, it, there's still a major question about capacity. Right? The, even if we satisfy some of the legal um, liability issues or concerns, or even go through the actual bureaucratic process of, of applying for an RFP, who's going to actually, or, are we actually going to maintain something like that with, uh, with GPS coordinates and, uh, and provide service for it for two years with volunteers? I mean, anybody who's ever worked with volunteers before knows it's not the most reliable means <laughs> of, uh, of you know, I'm getting activities out of anybody. So what they've done, and this is where that accelerator concept comes in. We see this as, as a major, major area of innovation. There's a huge economic potential here, especially for something like uh, an open vehicle tracker, right? So this is something we really, really want to start looking into. We don't want to pretend that the answer is going to be easy. There are going to be a lot of interesting issues coming out of peer-to-peer -peer development. And, and once you start crossing lines between public and private spheres, it's never going to be easy. But it's, it's clearly an area of, of, uh, of enormous potential. Um, this is, again, this is the components of the uh, Easy RFP program. Um, this is from, uh, okay, so procurement's the challenge, but even just in open hardware in general, and this is where I'd like to end. Uh, this is still the challenge, right? It's where do we find that GitHub for, for open hardware? Where do we find that, that sort of standard and best practices, especially if you want to start building businesses off of open hardware, right? Does that exist? Uh, this is last year. I know this was a huge discussion at last year's Open Source Hardware Summit. This is from Chris Anderson, who ended up publishing uh, Makers, the New Industrial Revolution, subsequently. Uh, and he has some, he's done some really good work in terms of you know, what the numbers are and what, uh, what it takes to, to run a successful business based in open hardware. He also, he's also the one who came out with DIY drones, used to edit Wired, I think. Was it Wired? I think it was Wired. Yeah. Yeah, not Ted Chris Anderson. <laughs> um, but still, so this, this is what he was, uh, this is the question they were asking last year. Again, my inkling is the answer to this is GitHub. It's, it's about working within the GitHub structure, I think. Unless anybody else is, I mean, has anybody else seen a, a, something that's, that could actually stand up for open hardware, the role that GitHub plays in software? Yeah. GitHub is starting to adapt itself to that already. Exactly. 
Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think we're pretty much almost done. Um, this is this is some more of uh, Chris Ad, uh, Chris Anderson's principles of uh, how to actually do the business model. Um, this is again in 2012 from the uh, Hardware Summit, I think. Um, I have the documentation here. Uh, but again, these are the, the problem pieces. I had, yeah, and we'll have my slides online. I think it skipped one of the most important slides, though. But I, that's okay. I can, I'll open it up for, here we go. This is, a very, this is an interesting uh, article I had just found recently that's about how open hardware actually opens up uh, involvement. It's, it's actually more inclusive from a gender perspective. Uh, as, this is a fantastic article, actually. Really? When, when was that? It was one of the earlier sessions? I just got here. So. Huh. Could you repeat that? I'm sorry. That's, that's really interesting. So he said it was 30% women are involved in open hardware. And how did he define hardware? Chi, sorry. Um, well, a piece of hardware hacker. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, she's in, she's, she's in the, um, trying to sort of make the space. Yeah. It's just definitely something, especially when you consider crafters and the, the lines, where, when the lines start to blur in the crafting community. Uh, it really does make a lot of sense. And so I think it's in very similar ways that it allows for these sort of intersections with other forms of DIY that it also potentially empowers smaller towns, smaller cities, which have been left out of the, uh, of the technological revolution so far. All right. All right. Thank you.